All right, hi everyone. This video is the first um, of our new unit, unit three, on semi-formal and suggestive persuasion. So let me get going here. Um, there's a lot of ground that this chapter covers, and as always, I'm just going to hit the stuff that I think is most important for our purposes. But starting off, you know, so he starts off by looking at this business of um, subliminal advertising. And frankly, I don't know how much this matters to us at all, really. Um, and I appreciate the effort that he puts into that first chunk, basically to say, like, I think when he wrote this, subliminal advertising was still like, oh my goodness, subliminal. The whole point about subliminal advertising is like, they're sneaking something in. Right? And it's like, we're not aware of it. You can't see it. You can't notice it. It's slipping below the level of any kind of awareness. Subliminal. The liminal is the limb between the unconscious and the conscious. So it's below conscious, right? So more or less by definition, we're talking about messages inside of messages that are meant to kind of like drop these little magical rhetorical bombs inside of us and explode in action that we can barely understand. We're just kind of being engineered. It's more paranoia, it's more fantasy than anything, right? And so he works through a number of examples and kind of debunks the power of subliminal messaging. I honestly don't hear much about subliminal messaging at all anymore. I remember, you know, tobacco companies put things in there and it's like, oh, look, look, there's a, the Joe Camel has an erect penis. I remember people trying to show me the erect penis and it's like, what, what is that going to accomplish? I mean, that's one of those just like happenstance kind of like looking at a cloud and seeing, oh, look, there's, there's a cannonball, right? It's just a round shape, you know? So I think a lot of the, and his point is like a lot of this subliminal stuff is just kind of like hokum. So there's not much that we need to focus on with subliminal because there's plenty of us to look at when it comes to the motivational and authoritative levels, the covert and the semi-open levels, where we're dimly aware of what's happening but still susceptible. That's, that's I think, where the, the real action for us is happening and, and what we should be talking about. So we'll just kind of quickly bounce over the subliminal stuff. Um, yeah, his point is, is like, What's interesting about subliminal is how much we think it works. And so the idea is like the message itself doesn't persuade us, but we become persuaded if we think that the message has subliminal messaging in it. So we persuade ourselves under the assumption that there's something in there that's persuasive. That's pretty bizarre, right? So let's just kind of set subliminal advertising aside. We don't know when where it is when it's happening who's doing it and why it's kind of irrelevant red herring all right so the chapter kind of begins and and tries to set itself up in terms of the elaboration likelihood model again which is, which is about what we attend to and what we um where we kind of pool our energies and again the peripheral and, or the peripheral and the central processing routes are key for thinking about how advertising is coming at us and the kinds of advertising so he wants to start off by focusing more on the low involvement. Low involvement, again, is peripheral. That's where we're like not really interested. You know, we're getting a coffee or we're getting a, getting some lunch or, you know, we're buying, I don't know, some new power cord for our phone or whatever because we lost the other one or it stopped working. And we're kind of like, eh, whatever. It's a few bucks. It's not a big deal. I kind of could go this way or that way. I don't really care that much, right? So I'm barely paying attention. My choices don't really matter to me hugely one way or the other. So I'm pretty susceptible to all kinds of low-level appeals in that regard. And you can imagine a lot of advertising, you know, research dollars going into the, like, getting this consumer to go from here to here, just like that far is all you need. Just a little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a kind of, mm, is all it takes to get someone to, to go from, like, oh, I'll get the large, or no, I'll get the extra large, or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so the, the bulk of the chapter is on low involvement, because there's a lot of stuff that's, that's usable there. And then we finish off with some high involvement stuff. But there's some, some really interesting little bits and pieces along the way here. Um, so let's see here. Uh, first of all, number three, I've already talked about the first two points number on the, on the notes here. These are posted. Um, number three is this business of just mere exposure and repetition, right? 
Advertising works. It works on all of us. It doesn't work all the time on everyone, but it certainly does work. And number three here is basically saying just being exposed to an ad, being exposed to an advertisement, some message is really the, the, the first kind of consideration, right? Like if you see it. So mere exposure is a very low level, but even mere exposure can work. But then add repetition to it, right? You expose someone to a message over and over again, and that's just increasing the likelihood that they'll at least try it or consider it, right? So repetition and what would we call that? Proximity, right? Being in, in exposed to a message is, is already an important part of what it takes to actually get people to, to try and to consider, okay? So that that's persuasive. All right, number four is like one of the most important points and, and, and uh, sections in this whole chapter, I would say, this business of association. When you think about it, how much of advertising is association? I think most of it. What, what's going on here in any given advertisement, right? If you're someone who's created an ad or like worked on a team that's generated an ad, you're selling something. It could be anything. Call it the product. The product could be an idea, it could be a policy, a policy change, it could be a message, right? Thinking about the last last week on the pro-social campaigns, your product could be a message about don't drink and drive or whatever. You're trying to get something out. But it could be an actual product. It could be a donut. It could be a new hamburger. There's a really there's someone I'm following on Instagram in Vegas who's doing like backyard smash burgers. And it's like, every time I see this, I'm like, I'm dying. I have to try one of these things. Um, so whatever the product is, from like super expensive to and like tangible and concrete to like ephemeral and it's an idea or whatever, but you're, you're trying to sell something. How do you sell it? Well, you're trying to associate this thing with good positive vibes, basically, right? This thing is good. You want this thing. This thing will make you happy. This thing will make you satisfied. It will make you healthier. It will make you stronger, faster, sexier, younger looking, whatever. Always some kind of like fantasy of a better me, a better life, a better whatever. So there's always that kind of like hard sell in terms of this thing will go with these things. And these things are always these positive, happy values, feelings, um, sentiments, that's the pathos stuff, right? So, so much of advertising is pathos driven and authoritative. Those, those two, the bottom and the middle level, right? Again, thinking Wilbert, but also thinking Toulmin and thinking Aristotle. The bottom, we've got the motivational, the pathos stuff. That's all of the, the values and the sensations and the moods, right? And the feelings. And then up a level, we've got the authoritative, we've got ethos, right? Hey, Michael Jordan wears those shoes. I love Michael Jordan. I want those shoes. Or, ooh, that is an absolutely gorgeous da-da-da-da-da. Um, sorry, I just got a text. And I, I just have to be near that. Like, I need that in my world. I need that in my life, in whatever level, right? And so, associating your thing with positive vibes is pretty much the whole game of advertising, right? And so when I got to this section, I, my brain was just flying, just thinking about all the different kinds of associations because it's more or less the whole game. All right, so let's see. Extremely powerful mode of rhetorical agency of persuasion when one thing is known to have certain qualities, whatever those qualities are, um, we try to associate that and but bring something else into close contact with it. Mom sacrifice everything for us. This Mother's Day, get your mom an instant waffle maker. So the only thing she'll have to sacrifice this year is cleaning up the mess. And you can hear the music, right? Um, so it's all about the sentiments and associating we, our love of mom with our, our appreciation for this instant waffle maker, even though it's a piece of crap and whatever, right? Um, so they note as well, or he notes as well, that, you know, positive values and positive sentiments, these things work. Memories, moods, feelings, right? Like playing catch with your pops when you were younger or like going on a road trip with your friends in high school, like all of these good, happy, positive, fun, loving memories become a kind of fantasy space that advertisers use to attach their products. Um, I'm going to turn my phone off. It keeps distracting me. Okay. 
Sex obviously works as well. We don't have to say too much about that. We know that just we are attracted to attractive things and people. And, and that attraction is itself, it's built-in persuasion. Think about the word, attractive. It's attraction, right? And so you attract eyeballs and you attract energy to the thing by putting a sexy entity next to it, right? So sex sells because it, attraction is already there. So why not use that if you're an advertiser? It's built in. Um, success, power, stature, celebrities, role models, also powerful attractors, just like we've already talked about. Um, and I mentioned Wilbert there, and this is the bottom of number four. So number five, we get into classical conditioning. Chances are you've heard about Pavlov's dog, where he was con the dog was conditioned every time he was fed or the food arrived, a bell was rung. And what was, was being conditioned is the association in the dog's mind between the, the sound of the bell and the existence of the food. So after a while, the dog starts salivating just by hearing the bell, and at a certain point, you can even like remove the food entirely and just ring the bell and the dog will start salivating, right? That is classical conditioning in the sense that the dog's entire like body, physiology was actually like attached to the sound of the bell as equaling food, right? This is the kind of power of association that advertisers are hoping for by associating their product with these feelings, right? Can you imagine... If you're, a, if you're a company that you're able to, to create an ad that is so powerful that just by showing it to someone, they'll actually like start salivating for your product. I mean, that would be the absolute holy grail because at that point, you're already hungry. You're like, give it to me now. I will do whatever. I will pay whatever, right? So what's what I think is really interesting is how uh, Perloff starts with the classical conditioning, which is really deeply kind of ingrained. And now think about other examples. Um, I, I think I use the pets like when you pets hear like the keys. It's like we're going for a car ride or they see you grab the leash. That's pets. But think about humans. Think about the kinds of conditioning that we have. Uh, you know, I've been raising kids for the last several years and um, I've been fascinated. These are not my biological children. I married my wife and, and she had three kids and now they're my kids. And I've been raising kids now for about seven years, eight years thereabouts, and fascinated by the kind of psychology of, of young humans. Um, and again, the conditioning that can happen through repetition, right? It's like it's, it's Sunday morning. It's, a, it's Starbucks, Starbucks, right? Knowing the time of the day, knowing the day of the week. Is it Starbucks? Calyx always comes down. Is it Starbucks? We want to go ready for Starbucks? It's very similar to Pavlov's dog. It's like certain conditions, certain moments, there's a kind of... Uh, almost like an automatic reaction that happens there. So the classical conditioning stuff is really deeply ingrained and it's powerful. And what he's doing is he's establishing that point, but then moving into semiotics, right? And that's interesting. We don't need to go too deep in like what is semiotics, but basically we're talking about signs and symbols. Not just like, I mean, it's language, but it's beyond words to thinking about images and thinking about representations. And you know, now think about some of the stuff on here on number six. Think about mascots, brand images, or logos, I guess that would be called. Slogans, catchphrases. Think about how much of advertising is falls into the realm of images, shapes, icons, obviously the golden arches, right? If I say golden arches, you already know what I'm talking about. Now, are you hungry? Or have you been conditioned in that respect? If I say, ooh, golden arches, are you starting to think about the... The hash browns and the French fries. The hamburgers are terrible. What else is good at McDonald's? I don't know. I barely ever go. But I know the, fra the fries and the, and the hash browns are pretty decent. Their breakfast sandwiches are not bad, too. Um, but I'm a snob, and so I don't like to go to McDonald's if I can avoid it. <laughs> but uh, Golden Arches, like the Nike swoosh. Um, there's certain things that if we just see it, we just already conjure certain kinds of moods. Ooh, it's... Ooh, it's... Starbucks time, yay, or whatever. Pizza, Domino's, woo, right? We get excited. The goal of the advertiser is to associate those things in the mind of the potential consumer, to associate their product with fun, excitement, yay, happy, happy, right? 
Um, so what else here? Think about mascots. Think about the feelings and values we associate with the Golden Arches or the Nike swoosh or the Cadillac emblem. When I was back in high school many years ago, it used to be like the big thing to like have a Cadillac. The, the thing on the hood. What's it called? Whatever. To like rip those off and wear it around a chain. That meant you were a badass or something. I don't know. Uh, it's like, but again, it's symbols and it's, it's insignia, it's images, it's all this stuff. That's the realm of semiotics. And that's also hugely the realm of advertising. And so it makes good sense to be following up the, the conditioning stuff with a discussion of semiotics because the whole point for advertisers is basically to create classical conditioning through semiotics, right? To associate this image, this logo, this catchphrase with all of these positive associations that you have in you to the extent wouldn't it be nice if you could actually start salivating or start your heart starts beating faster or your, your blood starts moving faster just because you're thinking about the possibility of going to in and out or whatever it is right that would be the goal um so really can't say too much about associations conditioning and semiotics that covers so much of what marketing is and how it operates persuasively. Um, and let's see, so that's all kind of low involvement, peripheral processing stuff, right? And again, it's about mood and it's about um, feelings and values and stuff that can affect you in, in a low involvement way. You're not super committed, you're not terribly invested in this purchase or in this product or in this experience or whatever. And so you're probably a little bit more easily persuaded this way or that way. And so you're likely going to be susceptible to things like personalities and uh, and the motivational stuff, right? The, the affects and the, the values and the sensations and the feelings. Let's face it, most of advertising is just that, right? But number um, number seven here, we, we switch from low involvement to high involvement. Now, think about when you're in high involvement mode. Anyone ever gone to, um, they used to have these um, consumer digest kind of things. Is it consumer digest? No, consumer reports. I think they still exist online. And the whole point of consumer reports is like, we're going to take, if you're interested in a refrigerator, we're going to go test every refrigerator in whatever category and we're going to break it down by the prices and we're going to break it down by the features and we are going to test and test and test scientifically, rigorously, test everything and we're going to come up with the results and you're going to pay a subscription to our magazine so that you can get the goods. I used to, to go to Consumer Reports all the time when I was about ready to make a good, big, at the time, you know, when I was like a grad student or whatever, like getting a, a Dutch oven was a big purchase. Potentially going to spend like $80 at a Dutch oven. I need to get the right one. Now, go to Consumer Reports. Okay, that one's way too expensive, but they like this one. Good. Done. Sold. I trust Consumer Reports. That's where I'm going. This is me in high involvement mode, right? This is me getting ready to like read articles and do comparison shopping and really spend time and focus and burn calories on this thing. And that's just for a Dutch oven. Now, think about a car, think about a home, think about a, a computer. Maybe you're in the market for a um, VR goggles. This is becoming pretty hot now. Um, whatever else, right? Expensive stuff or stuff that's like personal to you and matters to you on a personal level. That's when you're in high involvement mode and that's where you're in the logos, open, substantive kind of central processing mode. Um, now, note the, the little indent on number seven there. As a general rule, strong and cogent arguments on behalf of the product should carry the day when you're in that mode. Now, you would think that all advertisements should always be in that mode all the time, right? That's the truth mode. That's the fact mode. That's the mode that says our product does this and you can bank on it, right? We have the most reliable. We have the, the sturdiest, best materials, best craftsmanship, right? You can rely on us. And 3,000 experts say the same thing. And there was a scientific study that was done to, that backs us up. Now you're in that logos mode, right? But I think my sense is that we are rarely in the high involvement mode. Did I say high involvement a moment ago? That's high involvement, right? That is that studious mode. I think we're rarely in that mode. And so most of advertising is not in that mode. But sometimes it makes sense if you're an advertiser to just 
you know, run through the, the, excuse me, the appeals, run through the logos, run through the, the rigorous, rational, reasonable stuff having to do with your product. You know, when you're thinking about, I'm thinking about like a, a car brochure. When you go to a, a car dealership, they have those like fancy brochures. You can do an interesting rhetorical analysis of those because they're very logos driven. They're all about technical specifications, but there's also lots of the motivational and the ethos type stuff. There's the imagery and everything's so beautiful and slick and glossy and all that. All right. So um, when you're trying to sell your product to the high involvement central processing consumer, that's when you got to be straight up. That's when you can't just rely on good, happy vibes and sex appeal and Michael Jordan or whoever, right? That's when you've got to really like make the case on a logos level. And number eight is adding this new kind of twist of a theory, this functional theory, which breaks things down a little bit clearer in terms of, okay, now how, when someone is in a logos mode, what kinds of considerations? And so this functions theory, and I've kind of broken it down here, we can think about different kinds of functions. Utility functions, so I give an example of buying a car. If you're buying a car, you're probably interested in things like power and speed and handling and reliability and all that. So maybe you're doing some like research on safety, you know, maybe have there been any recalls? Or like what's the reputation here? But you can also be thinking about symbolic functions, right? Like what what driving this vehicle um, sort of says about me as a person. And there's also a social identity function. Like this is a, the kind of person I have. I would never drive a this or I would only drive a this. If you're a truck person, you're probably not a Prius person or vice versa, right? If you're a big gas guzzling SUV person, you might not be a super small, lightweight, you know, electric, low cost kind of person. It's about your identity. And then, of course, values expression is part of that as well. So these are different kind of functions that you can break down in terms of the high involvement processing, better understand someone's particular interests when they're doing that focused research. It's all good stuff. So that's pretty much it. I don't want to go too much longer here. We're already at the 30 minute mark. Um, number nine, yes, ads work on the imagination, especially at the authoritative and motivational levels, right? Those two, the bottom and middle level. There's a lot of, of fantasy stuff, a lot of like appealing to this, the, the inner self and, and your sense of, again, think Wilbert and the wish, the yearning, right? Uh, tapping into our senses of desire for a better life, a better me, a better tomorrow, a better everything. Um, and number 11, uh, number 10 on ethics. Basically, we know that there's lots of like false, distorted, amplified, straight up, goofy kind of reasoning. But his point is, is like, in the end, the verdict on advertising depends on the criteria we use to judge it. In the final analysis, advertising will remain an ethically problematic but necessary part of capitalistic society, right? So we all kind of tolerate these appeals just because we can't really get away from advertising. We need it to fund things. We need it to move products. We all need products, want products. We hate ads, but at the same time, we kind of love them. Like, I hate the fact that I have to deal with ads constantly. I finally broke down and paid for a monthly subscription to YouTube specifically so I wouldn't have to deal with the ads anymore. And yet, Super Bowl halftime, or not the halftime, the whole Super Bowl and the ads that run throughout, that's like the biggest exciting part of the Super Bowl for many people is to talk about the ads because they're so interesting and creative and they deal with so many different kind of social coordinates and touch points, right? Um, so lots and lots of really interesting stuff here. I think this business of low involvement processing and how the motivational and the authoritative appeals are coming at us and they're coming at us in these associative ways that associates associational business is really important so keep keep in mind on that um semiotics images shapes uh slogans right all that kind of stuff trying to create those positive associations in the in the minds and bodies of potential consumers um The importance of personality, we get into a little bit about that, but we talked about personality and the kind of the, the social status side of things. So 
I had to go quick. There's a lot to get through, but I think that's that's most of the important stuff. So that's it for advertising this week. Think about how many ads are coming at you all the time. Now, we didn't even get into internet ads. I'm saving kind of digital social platform persuasion for, for later, but we'll get back into it. For now, it's more of like the kind of pre- digital social world advertisements and just how powerful and all pervasive that stuff was. So we'll keep going. All right. That's plenty for now. Hope everyone's well. Talk to you soon.